Boom! It's mind pump time. Scared you again, didn't I? I love it when I do that. Especially Doug, the producer. Puts his headphones on, freak him out all the time. It's a good time. Anyway, here's what we're going to give away in today's episode. We're going to give away the Bikini Bundle. This is multiple programs we're giving away for free. Here's what you get. MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Prime, the Intuitive Nutrition Guide, and the No BS Six Pack Formula. All free for one lucky winner who does the following. Leaves a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode, makes it a good comment, entertaining, fun, descriptive, uh, encouraging. I don't care. It's got to be a good comment. We'll pick that comment if we like it among all the other comments, and then they'll get that bikini bundle for free. You also have to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. One more thing. Uh, in this episode, we talk about how to get the bikini body and maintain it year long. We actually refer to all those programs in this episode, all the ones that are available in the bikini bundle. Here's what we're going to do for everybody else. The bikini bundle is already discounted. We're going to take an additional 50% off. I know that's crazy, but that's what we're doing for a very short time right when we drop this episode. So if you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com, find bikini bundle, and then use the code bikini50. That's bikini50, no space, for that discount. All right, enjoy the show. I think it's important to to express this before we get into this topic. But uh, obviously, you know, Mind Pump Media is a is a what, fitness. There were men. Is no, that point that out. No. Okay, Mind Pump Media is a fitness and health company, and we have different aspects and uh, parts of the company. And one part of our company is our marketing team, and they're constantly talking to us about things that they think our audience or the market really wants to hear, and we t often give them pushback. And this is one of those things that they constantly tell us. And I think there's definitely value in communicating this. And of course, we'll do it the right way because that's what we do. But they tell, they, they, how many times have they said to us, do an episode on how to build and develop and maintain a bikini body? Yeah. Like yeah. a body. Now, here's the pushback. Okay. The truth is this like a bikini body is a body with a bikini on it. And that's the truth. <laughs> if you have a bikini on your body, you have a bikini body. Sure. There but I go. think what they mean is, or at least what people mean when they ask about this is- Beach how, ready. Yeah. Like, how can I get the kind of body that I feel good about displaying, one that's healthy, mm -hmm. one that looks uh, attractive and aesthetic? So let's focus on that, right? What are the things that make up a uh, you know, quote unquote bikini body or things that make someone uh, look or appear more physically attractive to other people or feel attractive themselves. Well, one of the first points that I think you have to address or say, um, and you say it on the podcast all the time, that a, a healthy body looks good. Yeah. Yes. So even though you might have this uh, lofty aesthetic goal or aspiring to look like maybe a bikini model or a cover of a magazine type of a person, uh, the way to keep it long term uh, is to do it the healthy way. Mm -hmm. uh, I could get anybody lean down for a, a, a bikini or a certain mm -hmm. size uh, by starving their body and overtraining them for a, a extended period of time, and they'll achieve this weight or desired size in the waist. But the reality of that is that's not healthy, nor is it sustainable. So not only do we want to achieve this, or this is an okay goal for somebody to have, but I think the the way you go about it is so important because- yeah, it's a huge point. I mean, you're going to get um, from all these different magazines and different publications, you're going to get the opposite. You're going to get the quick way to get there. And that's, you know, what people are, the consumers are looking for that too, which is a really hard thing to combat initially. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what we're trying to communicate here today is really like there's a way to achieve a healthy version of that and something that will last and but it does take uh, some preparation yeah, by the way um they lie to you when they say this is the fast way to do it it's actually not the, there is no faster uh way to do it other than the right way to do it the yeah. faster way to do it actually results in worse uh results worse outcomes yep. Yep. um also it's important to know that health looks amazing in person, always looks attractive in person. So you can try to, to fake and falsify and force your body through unhealthy methods to accomplish what you think may be attractive, but the healthy version of you probably will look better anyway. So even at the end of the day, if always you don't even does. care and you just want to look good, you know, because here's the deal, the roots of everything that we try to aim for to look more attractive, the roots of it are all based on on your health. Mm -hmm. Why do we find certain things in the opposite sex or, or even the same sex attractive? 
is because it comes from uh, health. It displays uh, virality, so you're virile, you're healthy, you can produce healthy offspring, you look like someone you want to be around, right? So you're, you're displaying kind of this good posture and health, and we'll get into all the details. So health looks really good, chasing looking really good oftentimes doesn't result in good health, but then, which then makes you not look good as well. So health is the goal, right? And so we're going to talk about, you know, some of those things here. Well, one episode. of the things you, you talk a lot about, and do you know by, I mean, I've heard you say it, but I don't know if you actually know what the ratio is, but one of the ways they've defined that is by attraction and the, the hip to waist ratio. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So they did these studies on, so what you'll find in different cultures are different size preferences. So we're talking about and specifically females, right? So in some countries, what's considered attractive by both men and women in terms of women tends, can be thinner or heavier depending on the different culture. And if we look at uh, what was depicted as attractive historically, mm -hmm. for example, if you go back to the 1950s versus what, maybe the 90s, for oh, example. It's so changed substantially. Yeah, it's, it's, it's much thinner, right? What was considered in the 1950s was attractive mainstream media was 30 pounds heavier than maybe in the but 90s. But there's something they shared in common. Right. And and so scientists, what they did is they said, okay, obviously there's social and cultural pressures, but there has to be biological roots to this because, um, you know, obviously we're driven by our genes in some way. What's in common? And what they found was, regardless of the weight of the model or the people that we consider attractive in the 1950s or the 1990s or today, or in China versus in Russia versus in Africa or in North America, is this hip to waist ratio, which is 0 0.7. Mm. Um, so what you do with this is you divide, I believe you divide the the hips to the, to the waist and it's 0 0.7 is the number you're looking for. I think that's the order of, of uh, finding this ratio. And then they said, okay, why is this 0 0.7 considered attractive across cultures all over the world? And they found that women who have this particular ratio tend to have better health mm -hmm. and have healthier offspring healthier births, and, and yeah. more successful uh, childbirth. Yeah. So again, this points to this, you know, this this biological health roots that tend to make us. Uh, it's so attractive. wild to me that that there's like this subconsciously you're driven by that and you don't even realize that. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very very interesting, right? So there's some other stuff. So well, okay, hip to waist ratio. Since we started there, let's talk about that for a second. How do we accomplish or get closer to this ratio of hip to waist? Well, you have a relatively lean physique, essentially, is what's going to cause this. Um, and this is also for men. There's a there's a waist to shoulder ratio. I don't know what that number is that women find attractive. And it's easier to get to it when you're relatively lean. So now I say relatively or healthy lean because getting too lean starts to look unhealthy. And although you can airbrush that on pictures to make it look okay, if you've ever seen someone that is unhealthy lean in person, you know it doesn't look, there's something about it that's not attractive. And again, it's because it doesn't display good health. For women, the body fat percentage that tends to fall in this range is like 15 to 27%. It's usually around there, right? We usually don't see uh, health decline with body fat percentage in women until they start to kind of go past, you know, 30%. So, um, Doug, what was the the what is that shoulder to waist for men that they found? 1.6? Yeah, 1.6. So 1.6. Very interesting. And then there was uh, I, you know, chest they have bicep to forearm ratio and pretty cool what what they found in some of these uh, some of these studies. Um, so relatively lean. Uh, what's another one? Uh, posterior chain development. Yeah. That's something that is considered uh, attractive in in women. Why? Why would we think that? Now, posterior chain is like hamstrings, yeah. glutes, back. My this is my opinion. When those muscles are well developed, you probably can move and perform well, and you probably yeah. are, are devoid of a lot of pain. I think it has a little bit to do with that, and also another I think factor that plays a role here, which is posture. Yeah. So I think the posterior chain is just, I think both men and women, it's, it's overlooked. Uh, we see everything and we look at everything in front of you. you look in the mirror and you see all the muscles in front of you. Very few people are looking back and checking on the backside. You can't see it when you work out. It's harder for a lot of people to activate and train. So I think in general, uh, focusing on the posterior chain brings anybody, male or female, their body up. Now, as a coach, when I was training bikini athletes, uh, this was the number one focus. Mm -hmm. Almost every uh, female that I train, when we assess their physique and decided to get ready for a show, 
almost always the focus was rear delts, uh, you know, uh, glutes, hamstrings. Those are normally the muscles that I needed to bring up to complement their front side. And I think it's true even with men. So even though we're talking primarily to women right now, I think generally speaking, one of the areas that mo I used to say it with men, uh, the back, like a uh, back won the show. Mm -hmm. A guy who had a very developed back would always end up w beating out the guy that maybe had a little bit better front side. And I think that judges would, would lean that way because it was more impressive because less people develop that. Yeah. yeah, I think it just takes more intention because uh, we do everything in front of us. And so it's just like putting more attention to the posterior chain, uh, you know, it definitely sets you apart and it, it stands out. And I think that that became a desirable feature besides the fact of the hip waist ratio, which you would naturally see like a wider hip kind of, uh, you know, with, with larger glutes. And, mm -hmm. and that would be something, a signal that you would see that, that would show like a healthy body. Well, and back to my posture point too, if you have got a great chest and shoulders and quads and you're just all these, the muscles in the front are, are developed more than it takes the body and, and kind of rounds it forward yeah, and yeah. and creates even if and we've seen this in both men and women you've seen people that are in great shape they got muscle they're lean and they're muscular but they don't look right but they don't look good yeah. and I, i've taken clients completely out of shape right and stood them upright right so i'd stand them in front of oh, a mirror I did the same thing and i would take them and i'd pull their shoulders back and have them draw on their core and stand up tall and tuck their yeah. chin and then say look look at that look how that little pooch is gone yeah. right just because they're a nice Im upright immediately posture. they look like they lost 15 to 20 pounds and look better without losing anything yeah. training or doing anything just simply by getting them to stand upright so the focus and the emphasis on the posterior chain i think does wonders for helping somebody just stand upright with good posture with when we're talking yeah. about building that bikini look or bikini body aesthetically, yeah, I think and when that's you're important. when you're uh, you know weak because of inactivity, which is very common these days, mm -hmm. those are the muscles that tend to atrophy the most because again we do everything in front of our bodies. We sit in chairs. We rarely ever squat. We rarely use or activate those muscles. Low back pain and injury is so common because the posterior chain, in particular, also because of the core tends to be weak. So when they're developed, uh, it demonstrates health, mobility, strength, performance. And here's another one. You know, women like to use the term curves. I want to have nice looking curves. Mm -hmm. You know, curves come from muscle. They mm -hmm. do. Now, and this is, of course, having good, healthy body fat percentages as well. If you have a decent body fat percentage that's healthy, again, like in that 20% range, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, but you also have developed posterior chain muscles, now you have curves. Now you've got the butt, you've got the hamstring curve, you've got the good posture. It's the muscle that really develops what I like to call, I used to tell my clients, firm curves. Like you want firm curves. You don't just want curves, yeah. but you want curves that look tight and firm. That comes from muscle. So those, those muscles from an aesthetic standpoint, but also from a health standpoint, should be a focus in terms of the bikini body. Oh, I used to tell my my clients that struggle with building a butt or wanted a better butt um, that the development of the hamstring will really uh, bring out the development of your glutes. I know, right? The curve of that and the way it tucks underneath the glutes like that makes the glutes look better just by developing the hamstrings. It reminds me a lot when I talk to my guys about developing their arms and they're so focused on bicep and triceps. that listen, you yeah. develop your shoulders right. really well and watch how much better your bicep and your tricep looks. Very, very similar with my female clients when we were talking about bikini competitors getting their glutes to look better i would put a lot of emphasis on the hamstrings because it makes it it accentuates it just like the shoulders do for the arms yeah and speaking of yeah shoulders uh it's true for women too oftentimes women will want these kind of sculpted looking arms shoulders really make that come out it's well, not i mean you, you definitely work your biceps and triceps but you don't need a lot of muscle on your arms when your shoulders are really well developed and strong. It makes the whole arm look, you know, lean and sculpted. It also what it's also what accentuates that hourglass look, right? Yes. So if you build good delts on you, it'll make that shoulder to waist ratio look even more dramatic, which mm -hmm. is, you know, when you're trying to build that aesthetic physique, especially on the competitive level, like you want to see that drastic difference, building those shoulders will create an, an even, even larger discrepancy between the waist and, and That's the true. shoulders. Now, the other one, let's talk about core for a second. And, and now I know this is both for men and women, but especially for women, they were discouraged from really training their core to develop the muscles. It was all about doing millions of reps and 
sculpt it, but you don't want to build wearing your abs. squeams. Yeah, you don't want to build your obliques. Okay, I'm. This is one good thing that I noticed from uh, the popularity of CrossFit. There's other good things too. There's some bad stuff too. We've talked about before, but one of the good things was they were actually displaying women who had well developed core muscles. Like you could see their obliques, you could see their abs. And, and it was great because women were like, I like that. Mm-hmm. I like the way that looks. Well-developed core muscles look healthy, therefore they look good. When you see that in public, <coughs> when someone's wearing a bathing suit and you can see their midsection, and it's not just flat, mm-hmm. but rather developed, it makes a tremendous impact. It, it really, really looks good. Now, I, w- I do want to say something, though, about that because – I do think it's normalized it for some uh, for more women that it's it looks good to have a strong core and I think CrossFit's uh, a, a good reason for that. But I also think that there's a lot of women that see that and go like I don't want to look like that and I want to make something clear cuz a lot of your high level CrossFit athletes that have these obliques and mm. they had that square kind of frame going into that's what makes them a good deadlifter right an mm. overhead presser like having a good solid wide core is less advantageous for getting on stage and competing as a bikini athlete because you want that tiny little waist and the wider shoulders but for a, a crossfit competitor to lift a lot of weight over your head or pick it up off the ground it's more advantageous to have a, a wider waist so CrossFit didn't do that to those girls. CrossFit didn't make those girls more boxier no, or it, wider. What it did is it just showed what night what developed core looks like. Now right. your structure can deter like your hip width and all that. Will right. Sort of, but if you have well developed core muscles, and your waist is the same size, you just develop the muscle, which is what will end up happening. It's like you make your waist bigger. It's very hard to make your waist bigger with muscle around your waist. But when they're developed right. and you have your body fat percentage is healthy, so you can kind of see it. It looks really good. Rather than just having a waist that's you know with a flat stomach, having some muscle that's visible, it just looks really good. Well, not only that, but it also feeds back into one of the, the first things that points that we made, which is posture. Yes. Um, it's what reinforces that. You know, one of my I used to do this little posture check with clients with their hands by their side, they go in front, out, retract. And then I'd, I'd tell them to hold that position. And all it was was like this little test to get clients to hold them, to to put them into perfect posture. And one of the things I would do right afterwards is I'd walk over to their belly button. I'd say, you notice how you're draw, And what it does, when you get into good posture, you draw it in. your core draws in to hold your spine upright. And so it naturally draws in and is activated. And I'd say, you feel that? I said, well, that's your, your core activating right now to hold you upright in good posture. So yeah, the first thing is to address posture, try and get you into that good position, teach you what muscles we should mm-hmm. develop to get that way. The next step is to develop a very strong core to keep it and hold in that yeah, position. Right. Now, you know, I know this is going to sound like a broken record, but the best form of exercise to shape and sculpt the body like a sculptor. What I mean by that is if you want to tr- develop your body in specific ways, if you want to be able to say, I want to develop this more. I want to shape this more. I want this to look a particular way. The best form of exercise for that is resistance training or strength training because you can target specific areas of your body. Unlike other forms of exercise, which are general, and they definitely have value as well, but they generally work the body. If you want to specifically develop and work the body, like again, like a sculptor, like you're a piece of marble and you're saying develop this, work here, shape there. Resistance training is phenomenal because I can choose more exercises to work this area and I can avoid other exercises because maybe I don't want to develop this area. So that's going to be the primary form of exercise that you use to develop a bikini body. Also, second, speeds up the metabolism, which makes it much easier to be lean and stay lean. Now, this is a definitive difference in programming too. So there are ways. So yes, it's it's great if you if you're just focused on strength training or you mentioned CrossFit or something in that regard where they're throwing the whole kitchen sink at you. Um, you can be very intentional about bringing very specific muscle groups up and to be able to f- hyper focus on those muscle groups to develop them and and sculpt and shape them to you know really be more pronounced and and th- that's the beauty of resistance training is that you know it's very moldable towards your goals but if that's your goal there's a very specific and intentional way to to address that yes okay so let's let's start with the let's give people steps right so step number one we talked about posture that's got to be number one there's a reason why it's a foundation yeah this there's a reason why for trainers and coaches posture tends to be one of the initial assessments so when you you get a client 
there's different assessments that you tend to do and, and they can differ from place to place, but there's often a, some kind of a posture assessment because the way that you naturally hold your posture, this is very different than the way you try to hold your posture. So it's not like, all right, hold posture and you're trying to make it perfect. Just how you stand naturally. That can lead us to realize, oh, some muscles are not as strong as they need to be. Other muscles are a little bit tight. If we adjust some of these discrepancies and help move your posture into a better category, we tend to balance the body out a little bit. So that's got to be one of the first things is look at your posture and address that and figure out what you need to do to get better posture. Well, it's also important because if you don't address it first, it's only going to be that much harder later. Mm -hmm. So you, you can get a lean, muscular body without addressing posture. I mean, you could lose body fat, build muscle yeah. on a frame, uh, and not address posture. That's absolutely possible. But what ends up happening is now you've got this person who's lean and ripped, and they have shitty posture. Right. And then, then if you decide, oh, now I want to go fix that or work on that, you've already reinforced all those bad patterns so bad that to go back and counter that, it's 10 times harder. So laying a solid foundation by addressing the imbalances by working on posture first is setting you up for long-term success. Yeah. In fact, uh, just to go further on that, you end up... Uh, adding armor to your bad posture is what you do. So yeah. if you have bad posture and you don't address it and you strengthen your body, you strengthen the bad posture, actually making it harder to correct, increasing risk of injury and reducing your aesthetic potential. So that's what we're talking about here. If you address your posture first, you've increased your aesthetic potential. In other words, you've increased the potential at which you can look good as well, you start to develop the body. And a lot of times I'll see, you know, the, the posture is being affected because they're wanting to portray uh, certain curves that maybe they haven't developed uh, enough yet muscularly. Oh, like so, lordosis? Where right, just, lordosis yeah. where you see the Instagram sort of pose where, uh, you know, in order to make, accentuate, you know, their, their glutes more, they have to get into this sort of bad posture position, which then, you know, take that into a resistance training situation, what that does to the lower back and then adding more stress in that mm -hmm. direction. So, you know, to, to be able to build off of good posture is essential going into you this. You also make it very difficult to develop the muscles that you want to develop because yes. of these bad They're not patterns. Active anymore. And what's and a very common one that you see all the time is the sleepy butt syndrome. You've got a client who squats, deadlifts, does all these movements that are important for the glutes, but then their quads just keep developing. So they just keep getting bigger and bigger muscles, but then the muscle that they're really trying to develop isn't growing at all, and that's because of the poor posture, poor recruitment pattern that they didn't address earlier on. Yeah, so that's what you want to do. You want to be able to wake up. Oftentimes, the muscles and areas of your body that are hard to develop is because you're, and just as for lack of a better term, okay, so all you, you, you science uh, nerds watching this, Yes, you are That's connected me. to your muscle. You know, all the muscles are connected. It's not like you're paralyzed. But we do use this term in training where you just lack connection to some of these muscles. What that essentially means is like if I'm like Adam's example of the squat. When I'm doing a squat, there's a lot of muscles that are involved and they have to work in unison and there's a specific pattern in which they use. And to just give you general, you know, numbers, let's say uh, your quads are doing 60% of the work, your hamstrings are doing 20% of the work, and your glutes are doing 20% of the work. Which one of those muscles is going to develop the most from squats, right? right? The quads. Well, what if you want the glutes to develop more? Well, we have to find a way to transfer that load to the glutes by waking them up mm. and teaching them to fire better when we do squats. And priming is how you do this. Priming is, is a way of warming up or essentially starting your workout by activating those target muscles so that when you go do these other exercises, you can really feel them work. So waking up sleepy muscles should be part of the initial, like how you get started with your workouts. Otherwise, it, it makes it much, much uh, more difficult. By the way, MAPS Prime does this very well. It's a program that we have where you go in and you help target and work on these areas. But we do have uh, videos on our YouTube channel showing some primers uh, I used, for some of these areas. I use Prime all the time with my bikini competitors, all the time. Because it, you're when you're trying to sculpt the body, like you're trying to target specific areas. That can be very challenging for the average person. Absolutely. I mean, we, we take for granted that we've been doing this for over 20 years. And so asking you to flex your shoulder or your quad or your glute or your hamstring, like you can do it like that. Mm -hmm. Most people are not like that. And if you want to develop a specific area or a specific muscle on your body, you've got to be able to do that. you got to be able to connect right to it and fire it. And it's just difficult for a lot of people, especially if that was an area that it's been 
underdeveloped for a long time because that's probably the reason why it's underdeveloped. So priming it and teaching them neurologically how to connect and fire better before they go into these workouts is huge to to building an aesthetic yeah, physique. It, it encourages perfect form. You know, exercises are only as good as you can perform them. So you can take the best exercises in the world, the ones that provide the biggest bang for your buck, that give you the most value, that give you the best results, or that you've read give you the best results, but that's the potential of the exercise. If your form isn't perfect, if you're not connecting well during that exercise, you're not going to gain any of that uh, potential. To give you an example of what we're talking about, this is a very simple one. Let's say, this is a common one, right? Let's say you have forward shoulder. So your shoulders tend to round forward. I'm exaggerating it. Most people don't look like this, but forward shoulder, I think you've seen it before. Maybe you have it yourself. Very common. The shoulders tend to round forward. Okay. So let's say the reason why your shoulders round forward, the most common reason is those muscles of the mid back that retract the shoulder blades, retract the scapula and kind of depress them and pull them down are weak, or at least they're too weak to support that good posture. So now you're going to go into your workout and you're going to do barbell rows or lat pull downs or something, but you haven't addressed that forward shoulder. What I'm going to end up doing with my rows or my pull downs is I'm going to make that forward shoulder even worse. How would I prime that? to get better activation so I can do those exercises and get better, perfect, more perfect form. An easy way to do this would be like a prone cobra, right? So a prone cobra, the, the whole goal of a prone cobra is exactly what I said, scapular retraction, so bringing the shoulder blades back and then depressing them. And there's usually no resistance that's done with this. You're using no weight. So if I do this at the beginning of the workout and really focus on feeling those mid-back muscles that promote that good posture and I can connect to them, and then I go do my rows or my pull-downs, now my form is different. Now I'm achieving perfect form, and I'm strengthening better posture, which of course leads and to you're getting better 10 aesthetics. Ten times more value out of that exercise now. Absolutely. Um, the other thing is to correct imbalances. Now this is this is a really big one. If your right leg and your left leg are not exactly the same strength, or you can't balance as good on either one of them, if your right arm and your left arm have a big discrepancy in strength, mm. if when you do an exercise, you notice you shift. Yeah, there's some asymmetry going on. Like one side comes up versus the other is kind of lagging behind. You know, all of these things we see all the time when people are doing squats or, or specific exercises. Yeah, symmetry is very important in aesthetics. They show this in facial aesthetics yeah. and, the, and in body aesthetics aesthetics, right? Does the right match the left? Does the top look proportional to the bottom? It's hard to accomplish symmetry when you have lots of imbalances, right? So mm -hmm. proper priming and correctional exercise helps you train with better balance and symmetry. So when you do start to develop your body, you're really getting a nice looking physique from doing them. And I would say this is something anywhere between five to 15 minutes, probably on the high end that you spend doing this before you get into your training. Exactly. This becomes, once you figure out what areas we need to address, that's obviously what prime is all about, right? When you go through it is assessing you, figuring out. And by the way, if you have no clue what we're talking about, this is the first time you've ever tuned into Mind Pump. Justin did a free webinar uh, on MAPS Prime to take people through. He literally takes you through the exercises. Yeah, three tests, yeah. uh, very, very simple straightforward test but yeah you're, you're able to kind of pinpoint you know what part of your body isn't probably functioning like it should that's what right is that? so maps prime webinar.com yeah maps prime webinar.com it's completely free so if you if this is all foreign to you what we're talking about i highly recommend going through that yeah very very good all right the next thing that you really want to focus on is to build muscle now i know some women are listening to this saying i don't want to get too big don't worry you won't get too big i promise you Building muscle is a hard, slow process. But here, I'll make a statement right now, right? So if you're watching this, this show or listening to the podcast and you're a female, and if I could magically add five pounds of muscle to your body, especially to the areas you want to focus on, if I can make you gain five pounds of muscle, I guarantee if you looked in the mirror, took your clothes off, looked in the mirror, you would look better. That's what muscle does to your body. It sculpts you. It, uh, you know, this is a term I hate using because it doesn't really mean anything, but I think people have their own meaning to it. They tones your body. <laughs> it's, it, it makes you look better and it speeds up your metabolism. Building muscle has this tremendous effect on your metabolism to where you burn more calories. In fact, if you're getting leaner and building muscle, or at least maintaining muscle through this process of trying to build, at the end of your fat loss journey, you could end up in a position, and I've done this many times, where you're eating more food to maintain a leaner body, 
versus what tends to happen with a lot of people is they lose weight, get leaner, and then they have to eat a lot less to maintain their new body. Which one of those is more sustainable, eating more or eating less, right? Obviously, the, the answer is, is quite obvious. So you want to focus on building muscle. How do you do that? You get stronger, right? Get stronger, especially at those compound lifts, your barbell squats, your barbell deadlifts, your presses, your rows, your overhead presses. Get really strong at those lifts. Those are the ones that are going to give you the most results, more so than almost any other exercise. I always think of it like, I used to tell clients that it was like, when we're building muscle, we're like a sculptor who's, because everyone has this look that they want, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone comes to you and they're like, I want to look like this. Or I mean, I mean, I mean clients bring you a picture of, I want to look like her. I want to look like this. And, you know, I, was, I would tell them that we're going to go through this building phase of just focusing on building muscle. I know that you see this lean little bikini and that's what you want to look like right now. But I'm telling you, if we want to sculpt down to look like this, what you, what you can't mm -hmm. see is the amount of muscle that this girl probably put on her body before she got down to this physique. Totally. And so what I want to do is I want to, I want to stack all that clay on you so that when we chisel down that we can sculpt and build this physique that you want to versus where you're currently at right now, where you haven't gone through a proper muscle building program where you've tried to build, add strength and muscle to your body. And then you think that we're just going to sculpt a physique like that. It doesn't work that way. That person to get that body that has that symmetry, that has that balance that even you're attracted to because you look at it and you're like, oh my God, that's beautiful. It's the, all the things that Sal was talking about earlier about the hip to waist ratio. You see that subconsciously and you're attracted to that. But that person probably, most people, yes, there are genetic, there are genetic freaks, but most people worked for that. Most people built... This, this muscular physique and then chisel down to have this more aesthetically yeah, and, pleasing. And, and not to mention, again, I have to say this again, uh, it speeds up your metabolism, which makes it way, uh, way, way easier. way easier to maintain. And, you know, here's the problem when you don't focus on building. You might get smaller, but you, you, you'll likely end up the, a smaller, same flabbiness, slower metabolism version of yourself. So, yes, you're smaller, your body fat percentage is the same, which mm -hmm. means you're the same flabbiness, right? So nothing's changed except you're smaller, but now you also have a slower metabolism. Terrible position to be in and impossible to sustain. Yeah, and this kind of bleeds into like the next point a bit, but like it provides flexibility. So, you know, when you do find yourself on the weekends or at somebody's house or you're mm. celebrating, you know, some event or birthday or anything where it's like, I want to, you know, have a bit and, and, you know, indulge a bit and have some cake or I want to have, you know, something that is off of, you know, my, my pretty restrictive diet. Uh, you can do that and you can live your life and, and your, your body's not going to be affected too much because your metabolism is is super healthy and raging. Well, this is also where you get to manipulate what you were given as far as your genetics. Yes. Right? So in order to, uh, like, so if you, if you are, what makes somebody have a bubbly butt versus a flat butt has everything to do with the origin insertion of the muscle, right? Those, those are things you cannot change, but that doesn't mean you can't take somebody who genetically has a flat butt because of the long origin insertion and create the illusion of a bubbly or rounder butt by developing the hamstrings, developing the glutes sure. to, to, to do that. And this is the sculpting building, building part right here. This is going back to my analogy of your stacking on the clay. This is what I loved about the way we designed maps aesthetic. It, it emulated what I would do uh, when I was getting ready for a show is I would look at, okay, okay, this is what the judges said. I don't have enough shoulders. My butt's not big enough. Whatever the, whatever muscles that I needed to develop, that's where I stack the yeah. clay on. So I go back to a building routine. Apply the frequency there. And then I would focus on a f specific muscle groups. That's where I'd stack more of the clay on before I'd carve back down to start to manipulate and change the way that my physique looks. Right. So that's here's the great thing is that you can manipulate your workouts. And actually, this is, again, this was a, a feature of MAPS Aesthetic. You can manipulate your workouts so that you do more for the areas that you want to develop more and less for the areas you're not as concerned about. This is the individualization aspect that is so powerful of good resistance training. You know, if, if I have naturally narrow shoulders as a man and I want to have wide looking shoulders, I can focus on developing my delts. And that's going to go a long way at making me look wider in my shoulders, right? If I have a butt that isn't round, I can develop that more. If my quads are overpowering to my hamstrings, well, what can I do? I can take away quadricep work and add hamstring work. So this is an important aspect of individualizing your workout to make your body look more aesthetic. Now, we're let's get to the nutrition aspect because that's 
Very, very important. And Justin mentioned mm -hmm. having that flexibility because you have a faster metabolism. That is key, by the way. That'll make any nutrition, any diet, any attempt at eating in a way that gets you leaner way easier, okay? It's way easier to get lean and maintain a lean body when you're burning 3,000 calories a day. And when I say burning, I don't mean manually burning, like I have to go move. It's automatic. But rather my metabolism is burning it because I've got good muscle and I'm healthy. It's easier to do it at 3,000 calories than it is to do it at 2,000 calories. Duh, super easy. By the way, I've done this, we, all of us have done this with clients time and time again, where I've actually got them leaner and got their metabolism to speed up. So that's Number one, but here's number two. This is very, very important. You want to, whatever you do with your nutrition has to be sustainable. And the only way to do that is to develop a good, healthy relationship with food. It is not sustainable if you view eating healthy as restrictive or as a punishment or as temporary. In other words, I'm going to do this diet for the next three months. And then when I get my goal, I'm going to go off. Uh, it's it's not going to work. It just won't work that way. And, and and oftentimes you end up in a worse position afterwards. Whatever you do with nutrition, you have to maintain and continue to do. And the key is to have a healthy, balanced relationship with nutrition so that for the most part, I eat in ways that facilitate a healthy physical body and it doesn't feel restrictive. It doesn't feel like a punishment. It's actually something that I enjoy and I want to do. And then occasionally when I want to value food for its taste for its enjoyment or for connection or I want to have a beer with my buddies or I want to have a slice of birthday cake because it's my friend's you know, daughter's birthday or whatever, I can do it and I have a healthy relationship so it doesn't lead to this off the wagon mentality where I binge, where instead of having one slice of cake, I have five. Right. Well, this is the difference of having uh, a bikini, getting a bikini body and keeping a bikini body, yeah. mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah, you can follow a very rigid diet. In fact, you could probably Google and find one online that's calorie restrictive that will lean you out and get you down to a certain place. But the idea of this episode was to teach people and give people the tools to not only get themselves in that kind of shape, but maintain it for the rest of their life. And the secret to that is in the relationship with the food. Totally. And that starts immediately. You start building that now. And a lot of clients sometimes would go, oh, just get me there, then I'll figure it out. Right. That's a recipe for disaster. The, Fail. You, yeah. the same way you build your body, you also got to start building the relationship with nutrition right away too, if this is something that you want to maintain for the rest of your life. And it isn't just simply a goal for Vegas in three to six months. It's that I want to get in some really good shape and I want to be able to keep it that way for the rest of my yeah, life. You know what used to trip me out about this is it's like you go to the beach and you, what is the beach typically associated with, right? You're there with your friends. You're there with your family. You're not there to just walk around and display yourself. You're really there to have fun. Oftentimes you bring beers, potato chips, some, you know, I like to bring watermelon sandwiches, hot dogs, burger, and we're playing music. We're having a lot of fun. My God, if you're, a, if your relationship to food is orthorexic, right? What is orthorexic? Everything has to be perfect. My diet has to be perfectly healthy. I have to eat the right amount of grams of proteins, fats, and carbs. And if I go off of it, it stresses me out. Yeah. Fine. You, you did that. And you accomplished this great bikini body. Now you're at the beach with your friends and everybody's enjoying yeah. themselves. Yeah. You can't have any fun with it. And you're, you're miserable. And nobody, you're the, nobody likes you. Secret, no. Secretly, <laughs> yeah. nobody likes you. Yeah. They might envy your body and look oh. at you. So nobody likes yeah, you. You're like friends like this. Yeah, you're, yeah, it's yeah exactly. You're sitting there and you're like, oh, everybody's looking at me. What am I doing? Oh, I can't enjoy myself. That's, that's, that so defeats the entire purpose. Okay. So what are the roots of a healthy relationship with food versus one that aren't? They're behavior based, not me mechanically based. In other words, it's not necessarily the steps and what I need to eat specifically, but rather how do I work with my behaviors so that they lead to better relationship to food? So I'll give you one easy uh, example. Okay. We all have those foods that tend to push us over the edge a little bit. Some people call them trigger foods. Mine is potato chips. If there's potato chips in my house, I'm probably going to eat a lot of them. And oftentimes I'll eat all of them all at once. I just love them. They're hyper palatable. It's very hard for me to control myself. I tend to lose myself into the enjoyment of eating the bag of potato chips. Now, does that mean I don't ever eat potato chips? No, I just don't have them in the house. Do I tell myself I can't have potato chips? No, I also, I also don't do that. This is what I tell myself. If I really want potato chips, I'll drive to the store and buy myself a single serving of potato chips. Now, what have I done there? All I've done is I've injected a barrier between me and the potato chips, something that gives me time to pause. Okay, so I don't say I can't have them. I say to myself, if I want them, 
I'll drive to the store and buy myself a single serving, so like a little bag of potato chips. What does this lead to? Well, when I get that craving and I really want them, and I go, oh, okay, I got to drive. And by the way, the yeah. grocery store for me is it's literally half a mile away, so it's like a long drive. But now I'm going to get in the car. I'm going to drive over there. I'm going to pick them out. I'm going to pay for it. All it does is it gives me space. It gives mm-hmm. me space, and then I ask myself, do I really want them that bad? You uh, can't just mindlessly indulge right away. Yes. Yeah, and yes. that's, again, and, and I know that uh, each person has sort of that food group that, you know, beckons them. It calls them, you know, and for me, it's, it's cookies or, or whatever it is, you know. Like, that's something that I know if it is in the house and I'm in that sort of mood, I want to get it in quick, and I, and I don't really want people to see me doing it either. Absolutely. And that's another thing is, like, the, this sort of this hidden, you know, like, habit thing that you have. But, uh, yeah, to, to create sort of some space with that so you can you can kind of breathe and, and and figure out you know is it really worth it is this really what I want right now if it is go get it if it's not you know let's just relax yes here's another one um, and studies show this that people when they're distracted will consume 15 to 25 percent more calories so what does that mean to be distracted eating in front of the TV eating looking at my phone going on social media uh, eating while while working or being on my, being on my computer. That alone leads to eating more. So here's a secret. Don't tell yourself eat less. Don't tell yourself you can't eat this. Just do this. When I eat, here's a rule. No phone, no TV, no distractions. I just sit here and I eat my meal by itself. That will lead to you reducing your calories. Behavior-based. That's a behavior-based model versus well, the other I, one. I think that this was the real motivation behind when we wrote the intuitive guide was we recognize that this was something that you know, we could say all these things real easily, but get people to actually practice this. There's some steps to get there. Yes. Like mm-hmm. Many people are still in the very beginning phase of like understanding what a, a protein, carb, a fat is, their calorie intake, what maintenance level looks like. There is, I want to point out, there is a lot of importance to figuring that part out, but that's a, a phase. Just like our training phases, that's a phase of your relationship with food. You eventually want to move out of that into this intuitive way of eating. And I do think there's steps and there's things, there's hacks like you were mentioning yeah. right now to be better at it. But it is something that you eventually want to move into. And yes, it's normal to start in the counting calories and weighing and measuring food initially. But the ultimate goal, if you want to sustain this long term, is to move out of that into a more intuitive way of eating. Yeah. What, one more takeaway. I'll, I'll just... One one more takeaway, just so people have something. If they don't have the intuitive guide, something they could take with themselves to help them out. Here's another one. If you are motivated to change your diet because you're focused on how much you hate the way you look, um, in essence, you don't like your body um, and that's your motivation, you will eventually fall off and you'll fall off in a big way because when it's motivated by that self-hate, or it's motivated by the, I don't like my body, it's gross, or whatever words or internal words that you use, now your nutrition is a punishment. I am eating this way because I'm not attractive. I'm eating this way because I hate the way I look. And nobody wants to punish themselves forever. At some point, you'll rebel from yourself, and that's where that binging comes from. That's where people are like, man, I was good with my diet, and then I went and you know, I got a pizza and I was just going to have one slice and ended up eating seven slices and I got so stuffed I got sick. And you think to yourself, well, why would you eat so much? One slice should have done it. Why? You rebelled because the way you were eating before was a form of self-hate. So this is a very easy one. Remind yourself that you're taking care of yourself when you're eating healthy. Not because you hate yourself and you hate your body, but rather my I deserve to be healthy. My body deserves to be taken care of. It's a totally different mindset and it does lead to better behaviors. All right, I want to touch again on core training because I think this is an important point and I still have to make it time and time again because people still get confused on how to train their core properly. To develop nice looking core muscles, it's the same strategy that you use to develop a nice looking butt or nice looking hamstrings or a great back or great shoulders. You build it. Yep. You got to build the muscles of the core. What are the staples of building muscle? You want to use sufficient resistance. In other words, it has to be good tension. So if I'm doing 70 reps of fast-paced ab exercises or bicycle kicks or whatever, not enough resistance and tension to really develop the muscles in any effective way. I want to be in that you know, 8 to 20 rep range with enough resistance to where it feels like strength training. That's what's going to get the muscles of the abs, the obliques to develop 
By the way, one more muscle you want to focus on that shrinks the, the core is a, a, our vacuums, called vacuums. It strengthens the TVA muscles that pull in this, the, the core muscles. And you want to also use tension with that, really drive it in. And you, there's a, I'm sure we can link a video to uh, where we demonstrated that. But that'll help shrink and tighten the core. But develop, don't be afraid of training your abs and your obliques like you're trying to build them. That's what's going to make them develop and look the best, the fastest. And you'll see them even at higher body fat percentages. Yeah, and when you really hone in on that technique to, to hyper-connect to, to your abdominals and your core and midsection, uh, it, it's a completely different experience uh, than just kind of banging out a ton of reps and, and trying to fatigue, uh, you know, that that muscle group. It's it's you can really start to feel the difference uh, when you start adding even gravitational forces, not even to load yet, which, you know, eventually you can work your way to actually loading some of these exercises so you can build and develop those muscles just like any other uh, muscle group. But definitely uh, being able to get in the proper form and technique will get you results even quicker than you know just banging out a bunch of reps well i want to connect this back to core and posture again too because like we talked earlier our core and priming right or priming excuse me in posture sorry connect the core to that so when you are when you are set up with good posture you also get your core and th those muscles to develop better where this is very common like we'd see uh, lower cross syndrome where somebody goes into doing core exercises or ab exercises and they just fill it in their hip flexors and they can't seem to fill it in yeah. their abs because they're not working their abs so this is why the beginning of this conversation started in the the priming and posture place because that's also important if you want to develop a strong core now i know you address that in, in no bs six-pack abs you get into like the hip flexor deactivator and making sure that oh yeah you're firing your core properly but that's probably one of the most common things that i would have with clients that are struggle with developing the core is actually not being able to fire it properly yeah. Yeah, the, people confuse bending the, the body in half with working the abs. You can do that at the hips, which is often what people do, and that's all hip flexors. Mm -hmm. The abs really bend you at the lumbar spine, right? So imagine the abs attached at the rib cage, the bottom of the rib cage, and the pelvis. And when they contract, they bring the rib cage closer to the pelvis. What they don't do is bend your hips forward. That's hip flexors. Now, when I said tension and resistance, for most people, this means no weight. <laughs> this just means slow, full range of motion exercises, like a physio ball uh, crunch. Mm -hmm. Doing a physio ball crunch properly for most people is enough resistance to build the abs. In fact, even for me, all I have to do is lengthen the lever. I just stick my arms out over my head and keep them like that. That's enough resistance for me to do maybe 20 reps max and really get my abs uh, to fire. So develop and build those muscles and then you'll have that kind of core that creates that illusion of that hip to waist ratio and really gives you those aesthetics and also, of course, protects the spine and contributes to good posture. Look, if you like our information, you'll love mindpumpfree.com. We have tons of free guides that will help you develop your body, burn body fat. We even have guides for personal trainers. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. Me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. See you at the beach. <laughs>